Hi, it's Jody Stewart from 98.7 The Gator, and we have a special Saturday Night Live coming up tomorrow night, Saturday night at 7 o'clock. We have been doing this for a few weeks now since we're all staying safe inside and we can't go out to the birds. Those are all on hold for now, obviously. So we're bringing the live music to you, and we have a special show this Saturday night featuring two hours of live Almond Brothers Band. And we're going to go back to the Wani Festivals in Live Oak, Florida, and feature some highlights of some of the live tunes from those festivals throughout the years. So I'm really excited because on this uh, chat today, I have longtime Almond Brothers extraordinaire manager, producer of Wani, and it's Bert Holman. Hi, Bert. Hi, Jody. How are you? Thanks for inviting me on. I am good. How are you doing? You staying okay through all of this? Yeah, I live up in Boston, and uh, we're, we've been hunkered down ever since the uh, March 10th show that we did in Madison Square Garden as the brothers, as a sort of a Almond Brothers coded right. tribute, for lack of a better description. Um, and we all managed to get home safe and sound, and now we're all hidden in our homes. Yeah, that was right leading up to uh, the big shutdown, right? You guys got one more show in. Yeah, we, we sort of got in, they played a basketball game, and they shut the whole city down. It's funny, uh, everybody in the band and I were sort of on a text the other night where everyone was going like, hey, is everybody okay? Because nobody's been talking to each other. I think we're all just sort of uh, hiding at home and forgetting to call each other, you know? So that was like a 50th anniversary tribute show? Is that what that was? Yeah, the, you know, it's 19, March 20, uh, 26, 1969 is the theoretical uh, – start date of the band and uh we had always talked about doing this show and we finally got it together in march 26 you know approaching march 26 19 2020 and uh yeah. for us it was 50 years it's a 50 year celebration there's always the big argument does when does the 50 come is it tw it started 2019 or did it start actually in 2020 when's the year complete <laughs> We had this. We had this debate at infinite of trying to figure it out. Yeah, well, it's like everyone debating when the uh, new millennium starts, right? Because everyone said was trying to figure out is it is it this year or next year? I don't know. But we're so glad that you're with us, and um, I know that well. The Almond Brothers, and I believe you founded the Wani Festival. Is that right? Yeah, the way Wani really started was Butch Trucks really had the idea. He kept saying, you know, we can do uh, uh, festivals that are Almond Brothers centric and have our fans come to us for a whole weekend of Almond Brothers music rather than traveling around to every place. And he wanted to do 10 festivals. And I said, let's try and do one. And the problem was, the problem was where to do the festival. And somebody who worked for us said to me, you know, there's this little folk festival I've been to in Live Oak, Florida. It's great. It's got a campgrounds. And I said, wait. It has infrastructure. He goes, oh, yeah, they have a stage. I said, now you have my attention. Um, through, my, through our agent, we reached out to John Stoll, who was a friend of ours and a promoter in All Florida. Right. And we said Never. to John, we said, Stoll, who we'd originally asked to do this, said, I don't know if I want to do a festival. Then we said, well, what about at Live Oak? And he goes, oh, I've done shows there. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. And, you know, one thing led <laughs> to another. He went and negotiated to get the facility. You know, we – uh, basically volunteered to do the show. We did it uh, as a partner rather than as a hired band and helped curate the show and choose the bands. And off we went, you know, and the first year, I think we did about 5,000 people. Next year, 7,500, then 10, eventually up to about 18,000 people. And uh, this went on for, uh, I think it was 15 years. I think, right? it's, I think it's about right. I sort of lose track of it. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons, and the band stopped playing, it made it a little harder to sustain it. Um, the band stopped playing, you know, in 2014, it was a, uh, a artistic decision made by the whole band to, uh, right. in, in 2014 to stop playing. And, and, you know, and with that was, you know, Greg's health was deteriorating and, uh, you know, yes. heavy touring was really not something he was capable of doing as much as he wanted to do it. Um, he started canceling a lot of his solo shows and, uh, um, in retrospect, it was really the right decision. You know, at that time, 2014, our plan was the last show we would do would be at Madison Square Garden. That's what they we always oh. talked about. And we right. did. Greg's health was starting. We had to cancel some dates in March and reschedule them. We put six shows on in October to make up the four that we canceled in in New York at the Beacon. We kind of never got around to doing yeah. it. 
the Square Garden show, which is why we did the show in, you know, this past March. It was like, it was the show we always wanted to do that we never did. Yeah, because uh, the Almonds did a stint at the Beacon for how many years was that? A long time. Well, they right? started in 89 and they went through 2014. One year we went to Radio City and one year we went to um, United Palace because they were doing a, a Cirque du Soleil event at the Beacon and basically we it wasn't available for us to use. Um, outside of that, I think we did it every year. I mean, we were, I don't, I've like lost track. I think it was over 200 shows. Well, uh, all right. I mean, there's a plaque in the theater in the back. For a minute. Um, I want to know, because I'm sure you were there every year, if not almost every year. So uh, can you just give us an outline on what that whole experience was like being at Wani? Because I know, you know, it was like um, not only a two or three day, but fans started showing up on like well, yeah, I mean, I was at every Wani, and we first did it, you know, it was a Friday, Saturday. They don't let you sell beer on Sunday, which is why we didn't ever do, why we never did anything really on Sunday. We used Sunday sort of the, the day for everyone to go home. And as you said, we started noticing fans were coming Tuesday and Wednesday. So we started doing music, you know, Wednesday and Thursday to sort of fill up the week for the fans. And Thursday started becoming a very big night for us. You know, it almost be, it be evolved into a three-day festival. Uh as a result of, of the fans showing up Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Also, you know, as, as a segment of the Almonds audience was uh, getting older and semi-retiring, you know, they'd come down for the week and, and just party out. I mean, the first year we did it, um, it was fun. It was exciting. Um, saw a lot of people that we knew, you know, there were uh, parties in the campgrounds. And uh, uh, as it evolved and grew, we started to, you know, evolve and grow with it every year. We'd literally stand on the stage while the Allman Brothers were playing with the Brain Trust, and we'd all sort of look out in the audience and go, okay, what can we do better next year? You know, it started with where to put the sound, right. where to put the lights. We need better lights. We need a better roof. We need more sound. Um, I was a big proponent of the Ferris wheel. I had seen it at, at Laguna Seca Days, which is a festival that Bill Graham did in the early 90s. The Allman Brothers played with Fish and Blues Traveler, and I thought it was spectacular. Just looking out from the band's point of view, seeing this giant lit up Ferris wheel going all the time. And from an audience point of view, to be able to get up high and look down on the campgrounds or on the festival site was a great experience. And uh, I, you know, I worked on it for a couple of years. I said, come on, Florida's got all the carnies in the winter, you know, w you know wintering here. Somebody's going to be able to find a Ferris wheel for us, and, which they did. I'm having a little bit hard time hearing you. I think we're having some just a bit of a technical issue. Um, we have our technical whiz behind the scenes, Clint, so I haven't been able to um, hear everything, but let me ask you this, Bert, because um, we spoke to not too long ago, and you told me uh, that obviously and you're still in charge pretty much of the organization all the time, is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, the, even though the band's not touring, you know, their life goes on. We're busy putting out uh, CDs. We're in the, in the middle of developing a long-form DVD of the band's uh, early recordings, early video recordings, film recordings. Um, we hopefully will have that out in the next year. Um, we have a live from Erie show coming out, which is uh, show Erie, Pennsylvania. It was a show the band did in 2005 in a small theater in the middle of the tour. And it's the show where everyone walked off stage and looked at me and said, man, that show was great. Can I have a copy of this? And it sort of became a legendary show within the band as being the greatest show they played. They all consistently said, man, that show was amazing. Yeah. And every time we talked about putting out a live track or needing something, everyone would go, well, what about that show from what they called Upstate New York, which is Erie, Pennsylvania? Because to them, that's what it felt like. And uh, we finally said, you know what? It's time to put this wow. out. We always sort of, sort of the one that got away. There was sort of, it's not a sexy show, meaning it's not from Atlanta. It's not from the Beacon in New York. It's not New Year's Eve. It's not an anniversary show. Right. It's not July 4. Um, it's middle of July in Erie, Pennsylvania. But they played great. A really good song selection. Um, they were all in a really good mood that night. Just really playing as good as they can play. So we're gonna, you know, we're ready to share it with our audience. You know, it's it's been out as an instant live, um, but we've gone back and, and tweaked it and remastered it and, and cleaned it up a bit using 
2020 technology versus 2005 technology and uh, put together a uh, right. extensive liner notes and some pictures from the time. And um, so put it out as a real CD for, you know, for everybody. We look forward to that. That sounds really cool. And, and since we are having a couple of technical issues, I, I just wanted to ask you one question before I let you. And that's, um, I, was inducted into the Hall of Fame, I believe it was in 1995. Wondering if you were there that night, and if you were, uh, what was that like? Well, well, there's sort of two parts to it. We were in rehearsal at Studio Instrument Rentals in New York for Beacon shows, and they're getting ready to announce who was going to be, uh, you know, inducted, you know, who, who was selected. And the band, it was the band's first year of eligibility, and they had really come to the... Uh, uh, I don't want to say resolution. They, they, they sort of came to the, uh, the point in their lives where they said, we're never getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know, in their minds, they weren't a band from New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco or London. You know, they were a band from the South. Uh, they never really right. got the uh, critical respect that so many other bands got. They weren't critics' darlings, per se. So they were really um, convinced that they weren't going to get in, certainly not on the first ballot. And when we got, when we saw it on TV, it came across on a crawl. We all, and I said, hey, we're getting in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Everyone says, are you kidding? I mean, they were shocked. They were absolutely shocked. They couldn't believe it. So, I think they prepared themselves to not get in. And then when they got in, you know, when they were, and then they were, you know, sort of, you know, were selected, they were in disbelief. I mean, that's the best way to describe it. And then, you know, of course, then there's, that's, that to me was when you really get in. Was when it's like getting in the baseball hall of fame when you get the phone call saying you've been selected. The rest of it's just a celebration right. down the line, and that was a lot of fun and really interesting. Um, uh, it was a great night. Uh, Dickie spoke really well. You know, JMO did, Butch did. Uh, Greg struggled. Um, he was really overwhelmed emotionally, and but it was a big night for everybody. And uh, we got to play a few songs and. Uh, hang out with our peers. Willie Nelson inducted us, which we were uh, very flattered by. Uh, you know, Neil Young was there. Bono was, was it? Uh, Eddie Vedder was inducting Neil Young, which was pretty cool. You see it in the... Uh, who inducted... Say again? Who, in who inducted the Allman Brothers? Willie Nelson. Ah, perfect. He gave us a re did a really nice speech. Um, it was really heartfelt and really appreciated. Um, I mean, they, they, everybody in the band has known Willie a really long time. You know, they've crossed right. paths a lot over the years. So that had to be that had to be special for them. Uh, it, it really was. I, for them, I'm telling you, the big thing was like when you first hear it that you're getting in. That's where it's like you just in disbelief because that's that's when right. it becomes, that's when it becomes real. So I said the rest of it's a party afterwards. You know. Uh -huh. but we're, they're, they're, very, they're very proud of it. We played the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, did a, uh, a fundraising concert in Cleveland, stadium show, which we played, um, which we were really flattered to play and, and, you know, really worked our schedule around to make that happen. Um, we were in the middle of a tour. We flew in and, you know, we drove in, drove out to make it happen, scheduled it. Um, it, was, it was a good time. That was a lot of fun because then you saw everybody. I mean, there's, there's a photo floating around of, of Dickie sitting and talking with Bob Dylan backstage, you know, and Dylan doesn't talk to oh, how fun. And Dylan doesn't socially talk to a lot of people, you know, and certainly not in that public setting. Right. Right. Well, um, thank you for all that you do, Bert. I really appreciate you coming on with us. We're really excited about playing music of the almonds. Again, that is uh, coming up tomorrow night, Saturday night, two hours of the best tracks from the Wani festivals in Live Oak from uh, the Almond Brothers. And well, I couldn't think of a better person really to chat with today. So again, thanks for taking the time with us. Well, thanks, Charles. I gotta tell you, you know, the band really appreciates the support, you know, the Gators, the station and all their audience has given us over the years. You know, they've been a big part of Wani and a big part of our success in Florida. Yeah, I think, you know, you make a good point there because because Live Oak is not that far from here, I know that every year, you know, for so many, it, it was an annual trek, and uh, people have very fond memories of those times. Yeah, you know, we, you know, we tried to, uh, we tried this year. We actually we were going to try the second year of sort of moving, you know, uh, Wani to the beach and try and 
uh, do something a little more um, uh, grown up, for lack of a better word. Uh, festival, right. The festival world is starting to now move into urban settings because the fans want to stay in hotels, which I don't blame them. Right. I stay at a hotel when I go to Wani. I don't camp, <laughs> you know. Who wants to camp? <laughs> hey, you know, I think camping, I, I think camping, staying in an Econo Lodge. Yeah. That's, camping, <laughs> you know? That's funny. Well, Bert, I want you to stay safe. We'll talk to you again soon. And thanks again so much. Anytime, Jody. Thanks for inviting me on.